honks during a traffic jam. Someone cuts you off or starts dancing on your car, sure, but even the biggest asshat knows it's not the fault of the guy in front of you. But if I'm in a traffic jam and someone in front of me gets out and starts singing and dancing, you can bet your ass I'm laying on my horn like a Road Rage Rodney. Sorry, I guess I momentarily thought Road Rage Rodney was a thing. My apologies. Sin still stands, though. Also, sure, traffic jams are an L.A. staple, but these f***ers are stopped cold for several minutes, which probably means there's a hideous accident up ahead that these dancing assholes are completely ignoring. They say we gotta want it more, so I bang on every door. Okay, I know this is a Hollywood movie with a gigantic Hollywood boner, but this opening number makes it look like everyone in Los Angeles is either currently or prospectively in the entertainment business. There's, like, other professions there, though, right? Aren't there actual doctors at the hospitals? Or are those f***ers all actors waiting for the big break? <laughs> How these assholes didn't die of heat exhaustion prior to now is a prequel I'd actually pay money to see. Also, this is a band consisting of timpani, stand-up bass, flute, and marching band bass drum. And yet, movie suggests everyone rallies around this truck to party during the traffic jam. Okay, it looks like everybody is having a great time. But I'm telling you, if you ride your magical appearing out of nowhere bike or skateboard up on my car, playtime is over. Yeah, but those lanes down there are moving effortlessly. These assholes on the sky bridge apparently have no f***ing clue how to zipper merge. Hey movie, your Marilyn Monroe is showing. Sebastian is not only able to pull into that left lane to properly scold Mia, but also pulls to a full stop in the middle of what's now a moving highway to give her the stink eye character forgets an appointment for one of the most important jobs in their life right now cliche. Oh. Mia not only is the only person in Los Angeles to own a f***ing parka with a fur-lined hood, she has it in her car and can use it to cover the coffee stain at a moment's notice. Okay. Kudos to the movie for showing us early on that Mia actually does have talent. We see several bad auditions later, but they aren't about her talent. It's because her heart isn't in it and she's distracted. So when she gets famous later, it's totally believable because of this scene. Props also to Emma Stone for making me emotional in a fake audition inside a movie. Also, I'm gonna go ahead and take another sin off for Emma Stone's cry face. That's a great cry face right there. Other cry faces are gross and snotty. This is a very clean cry face that I would like to point out. One second. This casting director and the girl that opened the door in the first place is addicted to terrific acting. You know, for starving artists, these girls sure do reside in what looks to be a 31-year-old's vision of how young women in Hollywood should actually live. Mia takes only one second to wrap up this movie's PG-13 rating. Movie takes time to introduce us to Mia's three closest friends, who later will play a key role in helping her adjust to her new relationship and issues. Oh, right. We barely hear from them again in the entire movie. Most egregious dancing in the streets since Mick Jagger and David Bowie. Man, what were they gonna do if Mia didn't go? I'm sure they'd have Uber or something, but they'd get right the f*** into Mia's car like she called the all-time DD for this orphanage of aspiring actresses. Movie sets the reddest bathroom since The Shining record that no one thought would be broken since, well, The Shining. No parking sign in the entirety of Los Angeles is this simple to understand, I promise you. You basically need a degree in theoretical physics and a graphing calculator to figure out where and when you're allowed to park. Damn, Damien Giselle became a master of color and framing seemingly before he hit puberty, which should be a sin because I'm jealous, but for this shot alone, I'm knocking one off. This movie introduces us to Seb's sister, who later will play a key role in helping him adjust to his new relationship and issues and... Oh wait, we barely hear from her again the entire movie. Does she like jazz? Probably not. Then what are we gonna talk about? I don't know, pop music? The Middle East? Why does your date have to care as much as you do about jazz? Because you're living like a hermit. You're driving without insurance. It Hold the phone there, Nancy. He's driving without insurance? That's like putting your whole mouth right in the dip. Oh goody, now even Damien Chazelle has an expanded universe. Oh wait, this shot right here of Seb's reflection off the tip jar? Yeah, that's gonna get a sin for the director showing off. <laughs> this restaurant audience. Sure, they're just here for a family meal and everything, but that was excellent pianoing in any context and should elicit some sort of response, so this audience. Did you test for a chromatopsia? DOA on 23rd, perp laughing his face off at the PD. Damn Miranda writes. This is my classroom. You don't like it, the door's to my left. Why did she suddenly get sucky at acting? Because that guy didn't kiss her? Because of The Amazing Spider-Man 2? Because of feelings? This entire movie depends on Mia attending some random party where Sebastian is cosmically also playing in the hired band. This is Los Angeles. Coincidences are ten times less likely out here due to sheer population size. I ran. I ran. A fantastic suggestion. Yeah, I guess I ran kind of describes their first encounter when he blew her off. But she seems overly confident this will get under his skin. And yet, it does. So, what do I know? I'm honestly surprised he even remembers her. He was so distracted that night from being fired. And I ran. This is actually the second movie co-starring Ryan Gosling and 80s music. Sarcastic Dancing Mia single-handedly provides animated gifts for the next five years. Questing Iran from a serious musician is just, it's too far. But right before that you were playing Take On Me, so aren't you really responsible yourself here? You're in an 80s cover band. What did you expect? It's a Prius? 
I mean, that, that doesn't help me. Awesome f***ing Prius joke movie. I mean, seriously. I was laughing so hard I had to rewind the movie like a whole five seconds just to catch up on what I missed. F***ing hysterical joke. Give that writer a raise and a half. Why is he dressed in a suit now, but earlier was in a t-shirt and an 80s jacket? Is this the kind of gig where you come play keyboard, but also then change and join the party? Does he take a suit and a bag to every gig just in case he meets Emma Stone? Hey movie, you're singing in the rain is showing. Mia brought her comfortable shoes to the event tonight, but waited until mid-song to actually change them after she'd walk up a fairly steep hill. And this is the moment I felt goosebumps from my love of old-school Hollywood musicals. And for that, this movie gets yet another sin off. Hey, it almost won Best Picture, okay? It's not like I'm overpraising some straight-to-video bull Good night. Parting after that adorable ass dance without getting her phone number. Is she double-clicking that tablet in the same place with her fingernail on a clearly blank screen? Movie doesn't know how to iPad. Wait, did Mia bring a blue skirt to work to change into? Because I'm pretty sure she was just wearing black pants. Mm -hmm. I hate jazz. She says she hates jazz, and then we get this jazzy, jizzy montage of jizzing the jazz. And while I want these two to get together as much as the movie does, I cannot condone the forcing of jazz on those who do not get jazz or wish to get jazz. And it's dying. Dying, man. It had its time. Indeed it did. And while I don't wish for jazz to die, I do think it's a minority genre that needs to play to its core audience to stay relevant, as opposed to trying to grow. Wait, so they were just walking together on the Warner Brothers lot when Sebastian said, What are you doing right now? But then they went all the way down to this lighthouse cafe, which is in f***ing Hermosa Beach, almost an hour away. And it's a cool shot of them walking in different directions, but shouldn't either or both of them be looking for a cab? I'm glad she's happy, but where is she going right now? And how is she going to run there in heels? This ain't Jurassic World, yo. Jesus, is everyone required to run down the middle of the road in this f***ing town? There's a perfectly good sidewalk right there. Striking, how does she stand directly between the projector and the screen and no one even flinches? She should be ducking milk duds and ice cubes by this point. This slow build to hand-holding scene is adorable, but it reminds me too much of my college girlfriend Molly, who after an awesome date with a similar slow hand-hold romance moment, proceeded to say goodnight to me and then still somehow suck off some townie named Jared in the alley before calling it a night. And a memory like that can only mean sins for a movie like this. Sorry. What are the odds that a film burn would occur in the projection booth just as these two were about to kiss for the first time? No, seriously, give me those odds, because they're astronomical for sure. No, that is not a driveway, and no, that is not a parking space. It just looks more cinematic than the beat-up parking lot for the Griffith Observatory that's just off-screen. If she's really floating, then I have to question many things about this movie's reality. But if this is merely symbolism, then it's beautiful. Sadly, I have only been paying enough attention to just barely not know what's going on here, because I am too famous and important to still give my work 100% of my full attention these days. Duh. So I'm left to guess that maybe she just ate too many helium cookies? Or maybe everything up till now was someone's dream and nothing I've seen is real? Shoot, I better drop some acid to find out for sure. Hey movie, your Wally is showing. Sexy dancing, sweet jazz, sexy dancing, sweet jazz. Oh, who am I kidding? Emma Stone won this battle just as soon as it began. Sorry, awesome musician Gosling. No, he doesn't have a steady gig, but he's, he's figuring it out. Jeez, Mia, exposit much? You know he's in the next f***ing room, right? This phone conversation right here can be blamed for the series of events that ultimately doom this relationship. Never before has any movie face better represented the say again now what crowd. Jazz is dying because of people like you. Replace jazz with film, and I hear this exact sentiment on social media every day. Doesn't make it true, but still. Wait, how is this YouTube video playing when the play icon is still showing? And where the hell is the timestamp? <laughs> this movie thinks an interview with an experimental hip-hop jazz group would get 899,000 views. <laughs> movie knows jack about YouTube. Damn, when this movie emotionally montages, it emotionally montages hard. Ah yes, the age-old story of all the young, attractive people attending a jazz fusion concert, then mugging the piano player during his solo. Always whips those kids into a lather. She is even more surprised about the lack of jazz in this music than Seb was during his audition. How many attendees can you really hope to get for your one-woman show when your chief marketing strategy is a last-minute CC email? Also, Mia spams all her Hollywood contacts and doesn't even bother using a blind CC. Mia, just, no. Do you like the music you're playing? I don't, I don't know what, what it matters. Let's put this in perspective here. It seems like Sebastian's had a pretty gradual transition from traditionalist to celebrity, but in movie time, it's only been a few months between summer and fall. It's like three months max. This guy was such a purist, he resorted to petty vandalism of the Samba Tapa place like 90 days ago, but now he's cool with wearing a fucking piano tie on stage. Why aren't we celebrating? Why aren't you starting your club? Jesus Christ, doesn't anyone in this movie know how to wait? Maybe you just liked me when I was on my ass because it made you feel better about yourself. Over the line, dude. Way over the line. End of the record cliche followed immediately by food burnt in the oven cliche. 
Two rocky relationship metaphor cliches in five seconds. Their relationship must be truly doomed. What the f*** is he even trying to make here? A giant pot pie? Burlap wrapped something? Hobo stew stuffed with newspaper clippings? I mean, Jesus, this is an abomination even if it isn't overcooked. When your one-woman play is one night only, you ought maybe to conserve the marketing budget and not paper the town the way you would if you had a month-long engagement. Or, you know, go digital with your marketing, yo. Why would they even turn on the house lights? For a curtain call, you'd keep the stage lights up so the audience would clearly see the actor. But in this case, the movie really wants to twist the knife on how cringy this shit is. Also, the single biggest mystery of this movie is how an unknown wannabe actress staged her own one-woman show for one night only and actually had people show up. Seriously, try putting on your own one-person show in LA as a nobody and see what happens. It'll be the polar opposite of the magic this girl encounters, that's for sure. And worse than that, she's actually gonna get famous after this. One of the nine people who saw this show was so moved as to get me an audition for a major movie role. Just think, being true to herself and playing to an audience of nine paid off for her. So obviously you should similarly ditch wisdom and pursue your foolish dreams. Don't quit your day job. If YouTube trolls actually left the house and went to plays. Amy Brandt, the casting director. Yeah. She was at your play. She was one of the nine people who showed up, because Hollywood casting directors give the finger to math and odds when going out to scout local talent, and attend mostly one-woman or one-man shows that have little to no word of mouth. Yeah, she stops him here, but what the sh**? Sebastian drove from mother Los Angeles to Boulder City, but gave me a six f***ing seconds after pulling up to the house in the morning. He's trusting this drive back to LA for the most important audition of her life to this car, this guy's part of a successful jazz hip-hop fusion band, somehow. And they were on tour for so long it broke these two up, basically. And my point is, he should have a way more reliable car than this by now. Emma Stone f***ing owns this scene. The emotion, the acting, the singing, the vulnerability. This scene might have won the movie all of its Oscars. One sin removed. When do you find out? Um, they said the next couple days. This question must have had Sebastian double over in suspense, considering he waited until they traveled all the way to the observatory to ask it after the audition. Where are we? You're about 20 minutes from the end of the film, and don't have time enough for this question to be asked this late. Also, I'm pretty sure you clearly broke up, so I'm not sure why you're asking for clarification. Like, we broke up, but then you helped me get an audition, so where do we stand now? I was in LA in January once. It was 75 degrees. Maybe the movie is making some kind of statement with the Four Seasons motif, but LA has been LA no matter what season I visit. It's not like it f***ing snows there or some sh**. Again, maybe that's his point. But then, what's his point? I don't care how famous you are, this is some bull parking. There's plenty of f***ing room and the driver still can't get between the f***ing lines. I could have two iced coffees, please. Right, of course. On us. Mother even if you saw her walking up to the shop, you still didn't have time to prepare this order. I go to Starbucks every goddamn day and those people at my local shop are f***ing lovely. But even in their speediest, they don't do this bull I don't care if she comes in here every f***ing day, this is some mind-blowing coffee preparedness. The realization that she ended up with someone other than Seb is sad, sure. But it's overshadowed by the feeling of where the f*** has Tom Everett Scott been the last decade? Which is distracting. I wanted to give this movie props for showing a realistic love story in which the main characters don't stay together forever. But the fact that both of these assholes got exactly what they wanted within five f***ing years is so unbelievable that I'm doubling down on the cinch. This ginormous Emma Stone is famous billboard on the wall of the jazz club is even more overt and obvious than the wall of Mary Jane Watson acting posters in the background as Peter drags his broken motorcycle in Spider-Man 2, which is even more interesting given Emma Stone's own time spent in the Spider-Man universe. You wanna check it out? The fact that famous movie star Mia just happens to be in the location of Sebastian's new happening jazz bar on its opening night is a coincidence wrapped in synchronicity, covered in a thick layer of epilogue and bullshit. If someone is staring at my wife like this for this long, I'm definitely asking questions. And here's where the movie both cheats and wins. We get to see that fairy tale coupling of Mia and Seb play out, and it feels awesome, even though we know it's not real. But then we also get to see the reality ending, where they both end up apart, because sometimes chasing your dream costs you relationships. That's deep, and only makes the what could have been montage all the more heartbreaking. Strangely enough, the bar they go into in this version of the story is called Tom Everett Scott's. For best picture. <laughs> La La Land. Okay, fine. You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. There are no two words in the English language more harmful than good job. Every now and then I get a little bit nervous that the best of all the years are gone by. Turn around.